Thanks so much. Yes, for better or worse, I've been uh, applying technology to the art and collectible market and helping creators think about how they can monetize their creativity, whether it's been through selling physical works online, or selling digital editions, or thinking about the opportunities that blockchain, NFTs, and Web3 provide to creators. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk how we got here, um, give you some examples of um, the NFT communities and how creators are starting to use NFTs in more novel ways, which is not just purely about digital assets, but the combination of digital and increasingly physical. Um, and then just share with you some of the kind of creative playgrounds, some of the ideas that we're seeing that I think bring such excitement to the space. So if we sort of first uh, look at the kind of great last phase of um, web development, often known as the social web or web 2.0, it was characterized by things such as influencers and video and social and podcasts and online courses. And as a result, it had this sort of new emergence of 50 million creators. It was really sort of the start of the creator economy, certainly online. But the results of that creator economy were, like many economies today, like disproportionately weighted. So if you look at YouTube, the 97.5% of YouTubers wouldn't make enough money to actually pass the US poverty line on a monthly basis. If you look at Spotify, 1.4% 1 1 take 90% of the revenue. And if you look at Patreon, again, um, less, let, you know, very, very few, 2% of, uh, of, of creators on Patreon actually make enough money to have past the minimum monthly, uh, mi minimum monthly wage. So the promise of Web3 is that it holds out potential greater economic success than Web2. The reality is that very few people have participated in this. Less than 1% of creators have actually sold, minted uh, an NFT. How do we get here? Well, the fundamental characteristics of blockchain, I think, are incredibly useful for creators. Uh, firstly, in the first phase, it was a much better form of provenance. Um, if we look at the um, characteristics that kind of enable that, and we heard some people talk about this today, the fact that you have an append-only data structure, the fact that you have shared cryptographic standards, the fact that you have a transparent timeline. And when we started Verisat in 2015, it was very much in the shadow of one of the greatest scandals uh, um, the art that hit the contemporary art world in the last 20 years, which was the oldest gallery in New York, the Nodler Gallery, was found selling Rothko's, fake Rothko's by the dozens, none other than the chairman of Sotheby's himself. And so if this can happen in a day where you know, we are seeing incredibly more transparency in the art world, it clearly felt that there was something wrong in the way that we keep records. So this is a, an example of a certificate of authenticity that the artist Shepard Ferry was using up until about six years ago when he started moving his system to Verisard. Um, now, the problem about pieces of paper is that they capture a lot of the information correctly. Um, and the information, particularly around an artwork, often is the title, the year of production, it's assigned by the artist, perhaps medium, perhaps materials, perhaps some distinguishing features. When we started the business, we actually thought about it very specifically around object ID requirements. We use an ontology from ICOM, the International Council of Museums, called CDOC. We've now loosened that structure much more significantly. But the difference that a digital certificate has versus a paper certificate are a few important characteristics of the blockchain kind of give you. First of all, there's now no confusion around timeline. And most fraudulent activity in the art world tends to sort of happen around a falsification of the timeline. So having Consensus around timeline is a big step forward. The other thing is that when you take the real world verified um, creator identities and you associate that with consistent cryptographic key attestations, you now have an ability to sort of add data in a way that can be cryptographically secured and verified that this was the same person who was adding it, or indeed if it was another person that was adding it. So the difference between, I guess, a digital certificate on the blockchain and a paper certificate is that the data is still the same, but of course you can do cool things. You can change the look and feel of it. You can uh, add you know, additional details. And really significantly, you don't have this silo of certificate, provenance, and registry, which is basically what happens with art and collectibles today. And there's problems with that because the registry is not always truthful. The registry itself can be fraudulent. And we see many cases from the Modigliani estate to others where the people in apparently controlling the registry found themselves under kind of criminal investigation, effectively in jail. So the interesting thing about digital certificates 
is that you can combine this data um, and you can create a verifiable uh, chain of data associated back to creator identity. So I guess that's the first point, which is that it's a fundamentally better way to handle provenance and it empowers creators to create better records, which prevents fraudulent activity from taking place in their market. And when you look at the creator life cycle, whether it's conceive, create, sell, or connect, blockchain actually has a role to play in all of these. We've sort of talked a little bit about the origin point of the creation, but let's talk about where we got to last year. Ironically, as, uh, as someone sort of mentioned, you know, we were one of the first to apply and talk about art or the physical art market and blockchain in the same sentence, but it took a new acronym, NFT, to come along for people to really wake up to this opportunity. And obviously the world changed last year. And the big change forward was that it wasn't about just certificates at the provenance level. It was now about verifiable ownership at a smart contract level. And the perfect conditions happened because we had this new generation of wealth that wanted to express itself in like other previous generations of wealth for its own forms of creativity that like, but also to be able to actually use the art as a currency itself. The NFTs sat in the same wallet as the physical sort of tokens, and it created this huge amount of liquidity. And what's interesting about this specific work by the artist Michael Jew is that actually with each transaction, the NFT itself changes. It's an organic crystal growth. Um, and so the idea that these NFTs or these artworks can also actually sort of relate back to the chain and actually evolve with the transactions, I think really fascinating. Um, now, of course, with these new marketplaces that came about, there was something for everyone, whether you were looking at open marketplaces, which were just indexing everything that was on certain chains, or you're looking at unique marketplaces that were selling one of one objects like Super Rare, there was this increasing desire to connect with this new generation of wealth. And we saw every single auction house do NFT auctions last year and still continuing today. We also saw new types of actors enter the space from the British Library to Madonna to we've heard about the sports sort of fans early with the success of NBA Top Shots um, and then new native artists. Um, obviously last year, the headliner was the $69 million free JPEG by Beeple. I think it's unlikely we're going to see a return to those kind of heady times. So I think what's going to happen is that the whole way that people use NFTs will become much more sophisticated than just putting something on IPFS, which is the free hosting site, or free, free content addressing site, and then pointing and then simply pointing to that. But it captured people's imagination and it also created a huge amount of liquidity. And let me give you an example, just a personal example. I bought one NFT from an artist called Danny Cole from his series Creature World. And in the first three months had over 300 different people make confirmed binding offers to buy that work. That's more liquidity than I've gotten all of my art collection and my wife's art collection in their history to date. So this is what's exciting about NFTs is the sort of reduced in friction and the ease upon which people can build new communities. The communities are being built in a very different way. Discord has surpassed any other form of social media in terms of building verifiable communities. And one of the main reasons for that is that people often will token gate the access to your community based on whether or not you're an active NFT holder. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about token gating uh, a little bit later. Um, if we um, uh, talk about um, the, the other ways that people sort of token gate, increasingly now we have a new app on Shopify that actually this week uh, Johnny Depp used to token gate his um, exclusive merchandise to his NFT holders. But effectively now, any creator can easily just start to mint and sell NFTs from their Shopify store or also uh, token gate to their community. And what's so fascinating about this is that the community itself, other people can token gate against too. So actually, if you think about it in the old days, basically all CRM was kind of internal. It was somebody's kind of like private system. The great thing about NFTs is effectively you're making it like an always on API that anybody can actually access. So if you look at the example recently with um, uh, Tiffany's and CryptoPunk holders, um, they were able to simply sort of go on chain, verify who the CryptoPunk holders were, create an offer to those CryptoPunk holders to be able to get a specific pendant. But other luxury good companies can do the same. The information is out there. And I think that's going to start to see, you know, really interesting ways that people will be able to collaborate and also be able to kind of cross market different opportunities across different um, communities. 
Um, so this is an example. I'm proud to say we launched it uh, just a few days ago. So we're now sort of very much in the polarized world of Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard um, um, uh, fans. Um, but Johnny Depp used three parts of our service. He used the holographic QR codes with secret kind of QR codes, which ties the physical work to the digital record. He also used the digital COAs through his store. So when people were buying these new limited edition prints, they got a digital COA as well. And he used the token gating element to his three and a half thousand or so token NFT holders that were given this one-time redemption of the ability to get a signed print. Um, this is pretty interesting. This is an artist who has the largest following on TikTok. Um, this guy called Jeffrey Allen Scudder, largest, sorry, following for his ge um, generative artworks. And, and what you can kind of see is that this is an NFT certificate, but actually the artist, and I can just show you, because I brought it along to, to show you today, this is actually the product that then sort of he sent me uh, from having bought the NFT. And I think this is really, really interesting because I think you're going to start to see the use of physical objects as triggers back to an NFT. And if you start thinking about what companies like eBay and Alt.xyz and Courtyard are doing, there's this whole area of where digital twins can benefit the additional liquidity that this world kind of offers, but they can be vaulted and they can be redeemed at the time when it's required. Um, Another example of sort of token gating is, you know, Shepard Ferry with his seven and a half thousand NFT holders from last year. He was, um, uh, put that back there. He, he's now, uh, last week issued, um, the ability for these, um, holders to redeem their works and get special, special bespoke merchandise for them. So I guess the complexity of mapping these relationships between digital and physical are not easily all done on chain. Because with NFTs currently, a lot of the metadata is frozen. So that requires the ability to sort of understand if an NFT provides specific utility, for example, it can be used to redeem something three times or one time, how do you then go and check that redemption? So the idea that you'll have NFTs nestled around other smart contracts and you'll have a complexity of layers which are, will work equally well uh, in the metaverse too. Um, I want to kind of just... Um, leave you with a few, I think, interesting initiatives that sort of talk to some of the divisiveness, that some of the conversation that's still very kind of present. I'll start with the middle one. Um, both of these very relevant, Damien Hurst exhibition, The Currency, aptly named, uh, is on display this week at his gallery in Newport Street and will culminate in the coming weeks of a burning of all the um, physical artworks that the NFT holders chose not to redeem for physical works. And actually out of the 10,000 that were created, um, about half chose to keep the NFT and half have chosen to keep the physical work. So we are living in this sort of like moment where the physical and the digital are sort of being played against one another. But the reality is that it shouldn't be an oppositional structure. You know, we've come from the, that the underpinnings of blockchain were oppositional. They were sort of Cryptocurrency versus fiat currency. And then it was oppositional crypto art versus contemporary art. The reality is it's just going to be an and. It's physical and digital. It's NFTs, you know, and your limited edition prints or your physical kind of works. And mapping those relationships will be the people who are most successful um, creators kind of moving forward. And the other two, just to kind of talk about on the left, you know, the, uh, in the, 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 the closer way that the code itself is being put on chain has proven to be incredibly popular. Um, the organization Artblocks has really been, after sort of Bored Apes, the most extraordinary um, success in terms of value. And then this last one by Async Art, I think is really interesting because it shows that again, an NFT doesn't have to just be one thing. It can have multiple, multiple layers on it. Um, so in this case, there are sort of 13 different artists and the ability for the user to buy different layers of those works. So in kind of summary, I, I think that the, the excitement in this space is, is, is palpable. I think that the creators who are going to succeed will not just be thinking purely about digital. They'll be thinking about digital and physical and how to connect with their communities. And they're also going to be thinking about collaboration because this is the best time for creators to build creator-centric communities and to also have the lion's share of the revenue in the case of something like OpenSea, they're taking 97.5% of the revenue versus typically in gallery representation, they're only taking 50%. So 
Yay to creators and more for blockchain to help them. Thank you.